Hey guys, welcome to the Bourbon Eating Podcast. I'm your host, Austin. Let's get started. So today I'm here with Bob and Brad from the Film and Whiskey Podcast, and they're going to tell you all about that later. But uh, I kind of I want to talk about this episode real quick. So we've been doing a series on whiskey pairings. I started with uh, pairing whiskey with whiskey, so like a whiskey flight. I've done, uh, you'll hit, listen to an episode Friday about p- pairing whiskey with cigars. And I'm also going to do a food pairing episode, but I decided to throw this one in as a uh, a bonus episode. <laughs> bonus episode. <laughs> uh, so this will be an episode about pairing whiskey with films. And who better to bring on for that than the Film and Whiskey podcast. So guys, how about you introduce yourselves? Go ahead and take it, Brad. Oh, Bob, you, you honor me. Uh, yeah, my name is Brad G. I am a co-host of the Film and Whiskey podcast, a proud Ohio resident, and man, I absolutely love movies, um, but honestly, I think I might like whiskey a little bit more. Yeah, and I'm Bob Book. I'm the other host of Film and Whiskey. That's kind of like the, the central premise of our podcast. Like, I've, I grew up being a huge movie nerd. Uh, Brad and I went to school together for a long time. We've been friends for, I don't know, 10, 12 years now. Uh, and we both lived in Kentucky for a while. We got super into drinking bourbon, and eventually it was like we were watching a movie together at some point, and I was like, we should do a podcast about this where I introduce you to all my nerdy movies, and we drink whiskey while we do it. Bob, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I think the very first movie I ever... Actually, Austin, what you said about reviewing whiskey and cigars made me think of it. The very first time I ever watched a movie while drinking whiskey, and I was also smoking a cigar, uh, was with our buddy Dale from college, and we were watching the movie Rocky. And I, I can't think of a better movie to, like, think about your first pairing of, like, a movie and a cigar and whiskey. Like, Rocky is just the epitome of, like, yeah, man, let's go. Oh, man, that's great. Uh, so how did y'all get into critically watching film? Well, I guess, I mean, like, I guess it's been kind of my hobby for a long time. Um, like growing up, I, I, my dad took me to see movies that I probably shouldn't have been seeing. Like as a young kid, I remember I went to see Saving Private Ryan with him in the movie theater when I was like eight, (laughs) which should have been traumatic, but I just fell in love with movies at a really young age. And I think you, when you watch as many movies as I did growing up, you kind of learn really quickly, like how to recognize what makes a good movie. And you kind of start to understand and put your finger on why is this one not as good as that one? Like, what is it about this that I like? What is it about this that I don't like? And honestly, for us, I think Brad and I both went to school to be pastors. And so, um, you know, in a lot of the classes that we took in college and in seminary, it was about reading texts and like how to read a text properly and how to interpret the context and what was the author intending to do and things like that. And when you're kind of steeped in that for a long time, you kind of start to apply it to other things. I mean, you can watch a game of football and and really understand coaching better when you're looking at like, what's the author intending all the time. So, you know, these conversations came up really naturally with us as we started watching movies together in college. And eventually it was like, I really think that we have some pretty good insights into some of these films and what we think the director or the actors or the screenwriter is trying to say. And that's kind of how the podcast, you know, materialized. Yeah. Honestly, I, for me, Bob, I'm going to give you a shout out right now. Bob had an ill-fated movie review blog that I thought was spectacular. And he ran it for, I don't know, it was like eight months, a year. Uh, It was something like that. But I remember when I was in college, I would read that. And that was like the first time I really started thinking about, you know, like, why did the director make this choice to film this, you know, scene from this person's perspective and not that person's perspective. And, you know, just like questions like that about lighting and about sound design and and things like that. So honestly, it really was Bob who awakened this desire to think more deeply about movies. Uh, And so for me, jumping into this podcast was just a natural uh, segue from, you know, loving whiskey, but also thinking, man, like, uh, let's revisit these classic movies, a lot of which I haven't seen, and just use a critical eye to say, you know, what? where is the value in this movie? Um, is there something that the public sees that we don't? Is there something that we see in this film that the public doesn't? It's just a really fun time. Yeah, I mean, just from listening to y'all's podcast, this is the only, only real dive I've ever had into watching movies critically you know looking at it like you said you know different in different ways and 
just listening to like your most recent episode on uh, Back to the Future, you know, going into I haven't seen that movie in a few years, but I loved it. I knew I loved it. And then y'all, you, you ruined it for me almost. I mean, rightfully so, but you ruined it for me with your episode and, you know, pointing different things out. And I'll go back and watch it. I'm like, wow, that, that's right. I need to, you know, pay more attention to to what I'm watching. But kind of going into that, you kind of answered this already, but how do you actually go about critically watching a movie? Do you have any, you know, any notes or any uh, process that y'all go through each time? I mean, as much as I like to make it seem like I just wing it and, you know, don't take notes or think about anything, I just, you know, come on off the fly. Uh, there is a sense when you're watching a movie critically um, that you're just asking yourself simple questions about why was this made the way it was made? Um, I, I think if you can start asking yourself that question about scenes, um, you know, friend of show Josh Larson is a professional movie critic out of Chicago, and we had him on for an episode, and we asked him the question, like, how do you become a film critic, just on a basic level, not professional, but just me as a viewer, as a normal person, how do I get better at critiquing movies. And one of the things he talked about was like, just pause, you know, at, at any point of a movie, just pause the movie and look at the picture and say to yourself, what do I like about this scene? What do I like about this shot? Uh, what do I dislike about this shot? You know, maybe watch a few seconds of the film and, you know, ask yourself the question, do I like the music? Does the music fit what the director seems to be going for emotionally? Um, and I think when you ask yourself just basic questions like that, you, you're really on your way to becoming a, a better digester of movies. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point, Brad. And, like, for me, I was actually watching a YouTube video a couple days ago uh, by this guy, Patrick Willems, who's a, a pretty famous, like, movie YouTuber. And a few years ago, he was making these little videos where he – the question was, like, what if Wes Anderson made an X-Men movie? And the whole video is in the style of a Wes Anderson movie. And it's funny because people who have seen, you know, Grand Budapest Hotel or Royal Tenenbaums or whatever one of his movies you've seen, you recognize his style immediately. You know, like when you watch a Tarantino movie, you're, you're pretty aware right off the bat you're watching a Tarantino movie. And so really for me, it's just encouraging people to pointing out what they already know. Like, hey, a Tarantino movie looks, sounds, feels different than any other movie. A Steven Spielberg movie has a certain feel to it. Now, let's just try to find words to express what we already know is different about each of these filmmakers. And I think that's that's kind of the point of our podcast. Like we uh, we're both really amateur whiskey reviewers, but it's the same principle. It's like I can I can tell that a Weller antique tastes different than a Henry McKenna. And it's just finding the words to describe what it is that's different about it and what makes each one unique. That kind of reminds me of, you know, how we talk about when you try a whiskey or uh, for me, it's specifically a bourbon, those notes that you hear people pull out, you know, the cinnamon or whatever, you can't pull that out of something unless you know what it tastes like or smells like. If you haven't had cinnamon before, you don't know what it, what that note is in a whiskey. And it's you know, finding those patterns and the more, the more with you have, the more, you know, experience you have, the better you are at describing that. And I, from what it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like same thing with movies. You know, you see a pattern like with different filmmakers or different uh, styles or genres or things like that. And you can kind of build on that, build on your knowledge. Yeah. And, and honestly, in the same way that with whiskeys, certain things pair together well, there's sometimes where you go, man, like I see the same elements in different movies, <clears throat> but for some reason it didn't work in movie B, but it really worked in movie A. Uh, I think an example of this would be um, the idea of the MacGuffin, right? And if you talk about like technical film, film lingo, a MacGuffin is like a thing that you have to find in order to accomplish an objective in the movie. But like the item itself, while they make it seem like it matters, the item itself could be anything. They just have to get this thing to move the plot forward. And a MacGuffin can be a really good plot device in a lot of movies. You know, I think about like 
Indiana Jones. Like the, the the whole conceit of the Indiana Jones series is around MacGuffins. We have to go get this thing. We have to go get the the Ark of the Covenant. We have to go get this crystal skull. Um, and you know, in some of those movies, it's better than others. But then you have movies like the uh, Episode Nine in Star Wars where the entire movie was a series of MacGuffin quests where they're like, we have to find this key and this key will allow us to see where we find the next item. And the next item will take us to the secret base and the secret base will be this and that. And, and it just kind of felt like everything was contrived. So like when you start to understand those little things here and there, you start to go, Oh, some movies do these movie tricks better than other movies. That's interesting. I've never really, I've never heard that term before. I'm already I'm already learning a lot here, but uh, I've never really thought about it that way. There's some some elements where the the MacGuffin is, you know, not important, but you know, important to move something along. And there's other times when it takes over. Uh, yeah, don't ruin I, Star yeah, Wars already, for me. You're please. already picking it up exactly what I'm saying. Brad's basically just trying to get you to trash Star Wars Nine. That's the objective here. I Bob, I, I didn't want you to call me out on that, but <laughs> but here we are. Don't get me started on that. Just, oh man, we'll be here for three hours. <laughs> uh, so I, my next question, moving on to the the whiskey side of things, how do you pick what a what whiskey you drink while watching a movie, and then how do you pick what whiskey do you drink on the show? So that's actually, I mean, that's a really good question, and I wish I could say that we were really intentional about some of them. <laughs> a lot of times, people send us samples of things, like like you've sent us a ton of stuff to try, and I try to like you sent us four samples of four roses, right? And I try to break them up so that there's a little bit of space in between. And eventually I get to the point where I'm like, crap, Austin sent us one of these a year and a half ago. Like we really should drink this. <laughs> so, but there are times where I, I think you can do a really cool kind of whiskey pairing thing with movies where if you understand like the theme of the movie, you know, like uh, if you're watching like Dirty Harry or John Wick or something where, where someone is like really hard edged and it's an action movie and you want a whiskey that represents, you know, John Wick. I'd tell you, like, reach for something that's high rye, right? Like, reach for a Four Roses single barrel or something like that. Because it really kind of has that harsher alcohol rye quality to it. You can do that with a ton of stuff. We we had a rye on the show uh, from the Few Company in Chicago. And that, that was really, like, light and floral and, and really bright in nature. And I would pair that with a completely different kind of movie. Like, I, I think you can, you can have a lot of fun with it. If we were really, we had a, a Peggy No Stevens on our podcast a few months ago, and she's famous for doing these cocktail parties and pairings. If we really wanted to get our Peggy on, like, we could, we could do stuff like that. Um, but honestly, a lot of it is just, like, finding cool themes in the movies and trying to make those connections. In a couple months here, around Christmas, we're going to be doing Die Hard on the show. And I paired it with uh, Yippie Kaye, which is like, it's the perfect whiskey to drink when you're watching Die Hard. There's just like fun little connections you can make with things like that. So I would say, honestly, like we don't take it too seriously. Once in a while, we try to find something that does continue a theme. And that's something that like you can do at home. If you're watching a movie with friends, bring out a whiskey that you think helps, you know, accentuate those notes in a movie. Yeah, I mean, the one time we paired the movie Green Book with Heaven Hill Green Label, mm-hmm. and 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 that was just that because they both had the name Green <laughs> Green in it. What he's saying is some of these are more well thought out than others are. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> I mean, I can already tell y'all are more planned out than I am. I we're recording this on Tuesday, June second, and hopefully it'll be released Wednesday, June third. Um. And you were talking about, you know, oh, we have we have this plan in a couple weeks, and that's that's where I want to be. But little peek behind the curtain, I'm not not there yet. Uh, <laughs> I did have this series planned out, except for this bonus episode. We came in and just screwed everything up, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> with our uh, with our bonus episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, so going along that, so what's your what's your favorite whiskey right now? I know that's a tough question, and I know that changes, but. What's your go-to right now? Honestly, I don't. I don't try to hunt stuff. I don't try to chase things down. Uh, state of Ohio, especially, it's like everything goes through the state agency, so everything's super allocated. They do lotteries and stuff like that. So you're never going to walk into a liquor store and find BTAC. It's just not the way that it's allocated here. So, like, 
For me, it's what's something that's really consistent that I can go to any liquor store and pick up, you know, even if it is a little pricier. So for me right now, it's like I love Henry McKenna. It's getting harder to find, obviously. I think maybe we're finally starting to come out of that, like, <laughs> the absence of it on our shelves. Um, I love McKenna because of those, like, really great peanut butter notes I get on it. Weller Antique is great. Um, but when you, when we're talking, like, budget stuff, I, I'm always going to go for, like, a, an Evan Williams white label or a Heaven Hill green label. I think they're just, they're super consistent. I know what I'm getting every time, and they deliver. So I think that's the thing for me is something that's always going to hit the right notes. Yeah, Wait, so y'all have y'all have Weller on the shelf when you walk in the store? Uh, so the really cool thing about Ohio is that, like, the state liquor agency has a website where you can just, like, type in the name of a liquor, and it'll show a map of, like, every store that it's currently at in Ohio. So, like, I can get on and, and look for Weller Antique and know exactly where it's being sold and just drive there and buy it. Yeah, oh, okay, well, that's good to know. What we'll I'm saying, Austin, after. is you need to move <laughs> up to Ohio. Dude, Dude Ohio so, is a glorious, bro. glorious state. So this is an audio podcast, obviously, so the listeners can't see what I'm wearing. But I'm wearing an LSU National Championship shirt. I'm not I'm not leaving Louisiana anytime soon. Look, man, we're big fans of Joe Burrow up here. Like, you can bring that with you. <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, yeah. I, I'll probably be up there a couple times watching him play, hopefully. But yeah, right now, I, I think for me, Bob, you, you hit the, the nail on the head as far as, like, affordability and consistency. And, you know, a month or so ago, we actually had Jack Daniels just – plain old Jack Daniels, their base offering. And I was just blown away by it. And I have been steadily moving my way through that bottle. Uh, so for whatever reason, man, the, the banana notes on that just just get me every time. So I, I've been really stuck on Jack Daniels lately. It is really cool when we when we find one that like we've tried a bunch or that we haven't had in a while. Like We just recorded an episode. It's going to be our season premiere for season three. And we did uh, Old Forester 1920. And that's, I mean, to me, if you want to talk about a consistent whiskey that you really can find anywhere, that's the one. Like, I would always point people to that Prohibition style. It's just it's just a fantastic bourbon. Old Forester in general has really consistent, you know what you're getting out of it stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, Jack, Jack Daniels, too. Um, and I recently had a, a single barrel of Jack Daniels that was really good. Um, can, I, can I ask you a question? Oh, yeah, go ahead. So I know that this is the bourboneering podcast, but I mean, I follow your Instagram page and listen to your episode. So I know that you're also big into scotch right now. And like Brad and I worked our way through a little sampler of uh, whiskeys from Glen Morangie. And like we were scotch novices. Like we didn't know the first thing about scotch. And by the time we finished that sampler, it was like, oh, okay, I think I can tell what a good scotch is. Uh, and there's one that they make called the Quinta Rubin which is the highest rated whiskey we've ever had on the podcast. And like, that's coming from two guys that almost exclusively drink bourbon in our day-to-day lives that if you want to get into scotch, I would highly recommend Glen Morangie Quinta Rubin. I'll second that. Yeah, honestly, uh, I, I made this big announcement on the film and whiskey podcast the other day, but that we're pregnant. Uh, but I had purchased Quinta Rubin for my, uh, for my brother for his wedding recently and when I told him, when I you know announced to him and his wife that we were pregnant, he broke it out, opened it up. I hadn't had it in a while. Oh my gosh, Bob, Austin, <laughs> the, the, the Quinta Rubin is so 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 good. I was just blown away by by how spectacular that scotch is. Now, did you have the the twelve or the fourteen? Was it twelve? Maybe it was ten. So they so they had a twelve and a fourteen year. Um, the one that we reviewed for the podcast was the 14 year. Mm-hmm. However, like within a month or two of me buying that 14 year, they actually changed their distribution. And now any Quinta Rubin you buy is the 14 year. They discontinued the 12 year right. brand. They stopped calling it 14 year and it's just Quinta Rubin. So it, it was oh, the really? 14 year. Okay, I, see, I the bottle I have ha- says fourteen year. I just thought that, but I had the I got I had the little sampler pack. Yep, with, that's the one with we the had. twelve year. Yeah, the twelve. Yeah. So we actually did the twelve year in season one, and I'm pretty sure it won our season one for like it was the highest rated we had in season one. And then in season two, we were like, well, we might as well do the fourteen year, and then it was the highest rated mm. whiskey we've ever had. So, I mean, you really can't I go wrong. But I think that they only offer the fourteen year now. 
Yeah, and I I like both of them. I've always been, I say always, like I've been to Scotch for years, uh, but I jumped into Scotch in the, the PD side of things. I really liked Isla. Like my first Scotch was Laphroaig 10, and I loved it. And I just, I couldn't find a, you know, a not PD Scotch that I really liked until I got into that, that sample pack from Glen Morangie. I'm actually... Uh, with my local bourbon society, we're doing a Zoom tasting. We got a sample flight of Glendronic. I got the the twelve year, the eighteen year, and the twenty one year. Oh, nice! And we all what the uh, we went in on a bottle together, and just it ended up being like thirty dollars for a one out sample of each. And it's just a way you can try something for a lot cheaper than get it in a bar. So I thought it was just a cool way, cool concept. We're doing that with uh, Four Gate is. Uh, they are blenders of it's American whiskey, it's bourbon, rye. Um, and we get, we're trying the, I think the second batch, fourth batch and sixth batch tomorrow, but the sixth batch is like a 200 or something dollar bottle by itself. And just insane, That's but crazy. I'm getting off topic. Um, yeah, scotch. I've recently been into getting into more of the, more than just the PD stuff. And it's, it's a whole new world that is way more expensive than bourbon. And at least, the baseline bourbons and that's why i kind of i kind of shied away from it because i mean as y'all know i was a college student until about a couple weeks ago and i'm I'm still uh i have a job but i hadn't started yet so it's kind of hard to branch out too far but i definitely look forward to that and even uh even even more rise and different different things other than just my regular bourbon i'm definitely looking to branch out more for sure yeah yeah honestly no, no, Bob, you do it. <laughs> I was just gonna say, like, how how privileged are we though as as bourbon drinkers? Like, I've I've been complaining for months about the fact that they raised the price of Weller Antique ten dollars a bottle, and it was thirty dollars, and now it's forty dollars. And like, even in Ohio, like, you go outside Ohio, you're spending like a hundred dollars for for Weller Antique. But it's even more like exponentially crazy when you get into Scotch. Scotch is just an expensive thing to buy, and so like, you know. I, I kind of have to keep that perspective sometimes of even if Henry McKenna gets marked up a little bit because it won an award, it's still not going to be as much as some of these like insane single malt scotches are. Yeah. I, I will uh, tell you though. You go ahead. Oh man. <laughs> oh wow. You're going to have a yeah, lot was... to edit here, dude. <laughs> oh, I'm going to yeah. leave some of this in. This is good. This is good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, I, uh, I tried the Oban. I think it was like a 14, a 17 and a 21. And like moving to those older age statements with the scotch, it gets so expensive. I think the I think the twenty one is like a hundred and thirty or forty dollar bottle of scotch, and it's really really good. And I really enjoyed it. It's not like crazy peaty, but it's got those notes. It's got that nice sea salt taste. But when you think about as a bourbon drinker, as a rye drinker, even as like an Irish whiskey drinker the prices are just so much less than scotch. And and it does make you wonder, you're like, man, like, is this, I, I get that it tastes really good and that I love the Quinta Rubin. And uh, unlike Bob, I actually do enjoy the peatier side of things uh, when it comes to whiskey without the E. Um, <laughs> but man, oh man, it is expensive. Now talk about, you know, I'm going to go back to this whole Weller thing where you're complaining about $60 a bottle. I have never seen a bottle of Weller Antique on the shelf. I've only had it from either bars or friends who had a bottle. I had to, I got a bottle of Weller 12 here. I got to get that at a Christmas raffle where they give out, you know, where you win the pappy and all that stuff. Yeah. Win the chance to buy, not win the bottle. Right. Win the chance to buy. And it's, I mean, special reserve goes in about. 10 minutes once the store releases it. Which is crazy to me. I mean, I don't know what your opinion of Special Reserve is, but, like, it's fine. I'd, it's like Buffalo Trace makers. to me. Like, it's just, like, it's okay, and I've never understood the hype around it. Kind of like Mellow Corn. <laughs> don't, do not get, all right. So, y'all, I'm going to have to cancel this episode. <laughs> we trashed Mellow Corn, and we've been hearing it from Austin ever since. <laughs> that is some of the best swill it's definitely swill. Planet. I'll give you that. <laughs> I was gonna say I'm not gonna argue on the swill part. I like it over Jack Daniels. You should give oh. Jack another try, man. It's it's good stuff. I guess we should start reviewing this this bourbon we have here. Now, this is the first time I'm reviewing a bourbon with a guest, actually. 
first time the oh, guest wow. has actually had we're the honored. same bourbon as me. Yeah, we're super honored, man. So uh, let's figure out how we're... I'm going to uh, talk about the bottle a little bit, and then I guess we just go one by one what we think on the nose and taste and finish. And I give... So I give my rating... I give a rating on the... Usually on the nose, the taste, and the finish, and then the value out of five. Or out of five barrels. Okay. So if y'all, I would love to hear y'all score out of five as well on these. I know it's a little different from what y'all do. So today we are drinking a product from Old Dominic, and actually, uh, Brad and Bob will give us a little bit of bonus. They have a separate product from Old Dominic that they're also going to try later. But this is their, I'm a ho- I hope I pronounce this right, Hewling Station, very small batch. It is a hundred proof high rye bourbon. Uh, they source this bourbon from Indiana, which I am assuming is MGP. But uh, they're very, very clear about what it is. They even give you the mash bill on the back. It's 52% corn, 44% rye, and 4% malted barley. They're very clear about It's their recipe. They didn't distill it, but it's their recipe. It's distilled to their standards and age of their standards. So that's, that's, all, that's really good when you have a, you know, a distillery that's very clear about what they're doing, where they're getting their, uh, their stuff from. But uh, I already have it poured, so you're not going to get a cork pop today. Sorry, guys. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, get on to it. Do y'all have any, any comments on it before we get into it? Well, first of all, the packaging is really great. I mean, it's got this it's just, awesome. this crazy bright red label. Got a nice square bottle. Uh, it looks great on the shelf. And sometimes like sometimes I worry about when a bottle looks too good on the shelf because I, I worry about are they spending too much time on the packaging and not on what's inside. <laughs> uh, but I don't want to tip my hand. But we'll, we'll see what we think when we get into the review here. <laughs> Now, check out my Instagram if you want to see a picture of it uh, at Bourboneering. Yeah, but besides from the bottle, uh, I'm I'm just going to go ahead and tip my my hand. Uh, I've I've tried this since they sent it to me. And Bob and Austin, this is some good stuff. I, I'm a really big fan. I, I think that this high rye count, they're, they're really giving it an opportunity. I, I don't know. If you're willing to let it breathe, to give it a little bit of time to settle – those spices work in so well with the sweetness of the corn in this that, man, oh, man, they have a heck of a bourbon for you. I agree. I've had this uh, already as well, both neat and in a old-fashioned. And it was great neat, and then the old-fashioned was amazing. And I think it's because of the high ride. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Uh, so on the nose, I'm definitely getting that rye. I get that kind of that rye spice. I don't think it's so much ethanol spike to me as it is actually that you know kind of rye spiciness there but there's definitely a a sweetness like a bourbon it's definitely a bourbon it's not it's not like a i wouldn't mistake this for a rye although the rye notes are definitely in the nose what do y'all think yeah i mean i think it has some of those really classic dark bourbon notes to it but you know to call back to like henry mckenna it it doesn't smell like a mckenna where it's just like super rich dark molasses and peanut butter like i think the high rye is really making this smell quite a bit spicier. It's got that, that great sort of tingle that you get. Um, I think, I think I'm picking up a lot of black pepper on this. Like it, at first I thought it might be baking spices, but it's got that really great prickly sort of pepper note to it on the nose. I'm really intrigued by it. Yeah. As I knows this, I will say, I personally think that the nosing is the weakest part of this whiskey. Um, it, it just doesn't come across very powerfully. Um, there, there's, there's even the alcohol forwardness. There's not a ton of ethanol. There's not a ton of anything for me. Um, I noticed some of the things that you guys are talking about, but I'm like searching for them on the nose. Um, so while I do love this whiskey, I think it's, it's leaving a little bit to be desired, um, on the nose. So I, I'm drinking out of a Glen Karen for one thing, but also I had it capped with a, a, uh, coaster. While it sat here, and I really think that kind of let it let the the vapors kind of build up. So when I first smelled it, I got a lot more of a you know a lot more of a nose than that. Um, but I have let this sit before, and I agree. Sometimes it's kind of hard to hard to find it. But it was yeah, definitely I, there when I had it in the old fashioned. It, it, I couldn't on the nose. All I got was the the simple syrup and the bitters. But as soon as I tasted it, it jumped right out. And I'm getting the same thing when I taste it here. Um, that rye again. The rye is definitely there. It makes itself known, but it's not overpowering. It's not super spicy. Like a lot of ryes, I'll get 
like a dill pickle note that mm-hmm. I don't like. Mm-hmm. And I'm not really getting that here. I'm getting the, the spiciness from like a rye bread, but not getting that off note that I don't like. I was going to say, this is like a really interesting like contrast for us because right before we came on with you, we recorded an episode tonight and we did Four Roses Single Barrel. And that's a hundred proof and it's high rye. And this is just in a completely different league for me. Like I, I love this whiskey and part of it, I was surprised to find out that it was as high rye as it is because you're right. It doesn't have that sort of like funky dill sort of taste to it. The rye contributes a bunch of spice to it on the palate. I think it's actually kind of thin for a hundred proof whiskey, but like it, not in a bad way. Usually when we talk about a whiskey being thin, it's like, this is not going to be a a good review. I actually think that the fact that it's not so alcohol forward really lets those flavors shine. You get some great sweet bourbon notes. And then right on the back, it's that rye spice, but it doesn't leave any sort of a sour grainy finish in your mouth either. Now I've had a bunch of MGP. And again, I'm only assuming this is MGP. There's only so many contract distillers in Indiana. And by so many, I think there's only really one. Um, But I had a lot of MGP juice. Some I love, some I hate. This is unlike anything from MGP I've ever had. So it, I I fully believe when they say this is their own recipe that they're getting MGP to make for them. And it's I don't know. I see. I got it. It was pretty thin the first time I had it, but this time I don't know if it's because I let it sit with the cap on it or whatever. But it it packs a lot more of a punch to me right now. And I definitely get the the spice on the end, kind of the the, I don't know if it's ethanol spike or just the rice spice on the on the very tail, and not necessarily the finish, but right before I swallow, and it's just, it's unique. I mean, I'd say that a lot, but it's it's its own thing. I've never had really had a bourbon like it before. Honestly, the, this might sound like a really weird tasting note, but it almost reminds me of like a nice creamy spiked eggnog. Like, there was a moment where, like, it was kind of in between the palate and the finish where all of a sudden I just thought about Christmas and eggnog, and I was just like, man, this is, like, everything I want from a nice, spicy rye. But it's not a rye. It's still sweet. It's still a bourbon. I'm just really impressed with the flavor profile on this whiskey. Brad and I talk a lot about 100 Proof whiskeys, and I don't know if Brad has it as much as I do, but I feel like 100 Proof for me is the most hit or miss kind of proof point. Anything in that sort of mid-proof range, because I feel like a lot of times a bottled and bond bourbon can be really, really harsh. And it's almost like the the extra aging or whatever it is um, with barrel proof, I, I find barrel proof sometimes to be more mellow than 100 Proof. This is one of the best 100 proof whiskeys I've ever had. Like like I said, it's a little bit thin in terms of mouthfeel, um, but it's not harsh at all. It is like incredibly drinkable um, and it just gets better and better the more I try it. It's not the most complex taste I've ever had, but it's just it, it just seems to hit all the right notes. And honestly, on the finish, I, it lingers with you in a pleasant way. Uh, I think one of the reasons, you know, Austin, you pointed to this, but a lot of times with high rye whiskeys, it just kind of sits on your on the finish as a sour, pickly kind of ugh. And I think that's a reason why Bob and I often stay away from rye. This one doesn't do that. It leaves you with a nice balance of the spiciness of that black pepper, nutmeggy type of spice. But it still has that nice, uh, you know, sweetness to go along with it. It finishes so, so well. And I don't know if y'all have more information than me. I don't see an age statement on this. Nope. And it does. It doesn't even say straight bourbon. Right. So for all we know, it could be, you know, five seconds old in a barrel. I mean, obviously it's not. It's dark. It's really, really dark for, and maybe it's just a bottle. I don't know. But it's really dark for a non-age stated or at least not touting their age bottle. And it doesn't taste young and it doesn't taste like they stuffed it in a small barrel to, you know, oak it really quickly. Yeah. I mean, if it's, I had to guess, I'd really say good. this is like at least six years old. The color on this yeah. is, is super dark, especially for only was, being 100 I, proof. I was thinking the same thing when I poured it out. The color is beautiful on this whiskey. Because uh, when you all mentioned, you know, 100 proof, and obviously it's not bottled and bond, but a lot of bottled and bond whiskeys, they have to be at least four years old. And a lot of times that's what they are, exactly four years old or you know as close to it as possible. 
And this, I, unless they have some magical warehouse they're aging this in, this can't be four years old. It's got to be at least, like you said, five or six or that or whatever they're doing. They need to keep doing it because it's great. Because I, I mean, I've never heard of old Dominic other than, uh, you know, I ran across them on Instagram one time, but they're, I don't think they're a big distillery. I don't, I, but I'm surprised they have whiskey that's this old or as old as it tastes. It's just, it's weird to me that something this craft yeah has such good bourbon really well and to me it's like I can't believe that there's whiskey this good out there that isn't being talked about I mean you know it might just be like their their PR or marketing budget isn't what some of these other like quote unquote craft people are but this is better than ninety eight percent of the craft whiskey I've ever had and like is it sourced is it MGP yes it is but like you said like they're using their own recipe they're bottling it on site. I, we've had a ton of sourced whiskey before. This is probably, like you said, the best MGP whiskey I've ever had. I'm looking up now exactly how much I paid for it because it was a really reasonable price, if I remember correctly. But uh, while we look at that, I'm just, I, I'm impressed. I have to give it, I'm, uh, before I give my final value score in this, I have to give it a, just off the, blindly off taste, not counting price, I have to give it like a three and a half to a four. It's really, really good. Yeah, like Brad was saying, I think the nose on this was probably the weakest thing for me. Like, if we're scoring on barrels, I probably gave it like a three out of five. But the the taste and the finish are both fantastic. And like, I don't think this costs more than like thirty or thirty five dollars. And if that's the case, then it's for me in terms of value, that'd be like a five out of five on value. Yeah, if you're able to get this bottle for less than thirty five dollars. Holy cow, man. I mean, you're rolling in some really good, not just good, though. It's unique. Like, this is a bottle that if I had a friend come over that was like, hey, man, like, I, I like whiskey. I've had a decent amount of, you know, the the big brand, the big company stuff. I Give me something unique. This might be the first thing I pull off the shelf. It, it, it's, it's just a fascinating little high rye bourbon. That I can't recommend highly enough. Uh, their vodka is twenty dollars. <laughs> All right, <laughs> uh, there you go. It is it is thirty eight dollars. Okay. On uh, th- it, it's sold out now on uh, Sealbot. Uh, I have an app that usually gives me the nationwide average, but I couldn't find it on that app. Maybe because it's just so small. But I, they're sold out of everything but the vodka on Sealbox, which is crazy because I bought this, you know, week week and a half ago. Um, but I mean, I think for what it is, I think $38 is a good price. And that's, again, that's online. So that's probably marked up a little bit. I have to, I'm, I'm going to give it a four, honestly, including that value in there. I'm going to have to give it a four that I'm really impressed, especially when I had in a cocktail. Yeah. Austin, I think I'm right there with you. Four out of five barrels. This is really impressive stuff. I don't know if y'all do half barrels on this podcast, but like, no, oh, yeah, like, yeah, this is, <laughs> this would be a four and a half for me. This is, I mean, I hope that they start to get the publicity that they deserve, because I think if you really like craft whiskey, this needs to be on your shelf. It's just not too much publicity. I don't need another Weller. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> I can't find my old Dominic. All right. Well, thanks for reviewing that, guys. Uh, so y'all have a, a little bit of a bonus review for us, huh? Yeah. So bonus we- review. Bonus bourbon. <laughs> so we actually got in contact with the old Dominic people on Instagram. And uh, they they sent us a bottle of this. They call it the Memphis Toddy. It is their sort of cordial, you know, hot toddy sort of mixer. Uh, it's 30% alcohol, so we're working with 60 proof here. It's bourbon, and they add some flavoring to it. Uh, they say that you can enjoy it neat or on the rocks or in a cocktail. Brad, I don't know if you've tried this yet. Um, I've, I tried it just on the rocks. And um, in terms of taste, it was, like, overpowering to me. It's just, like, it's straight... It's like they just like added a ton of clove and nutmeg and you're you're drinking them out of <laughs> a spice bottle. Um the the nose is really pleasant. It's almost like a cola and an apple pie mixed together. It's got some great baking spices. Yeah, I thought it it has a little bit of like a citrusy orange smell to it as well that I really like. For sure. But then when you go to sip it, I mean, I think it's it's very clear that this needs to be mixed with something. Uh, I appreciate that they say that it could be enjoyed by itself, but it's uh, it's really, really sweet, almost like a sweet tea kind of sweet, and then it's just straight nutmeg. 
So I actually ended up mixing mine with ginger ale, and I thought that made a fantastic mixer. It really adds a lot of depth and complexity to that and brings out some of those spicy ginger notes. I think this would be really good in an old-fashioned. I think if you swapped out adding simple syrup for adding this instead, you would have a really great old-fashioned. It has, like Brad said, some of those orange peel notes on it, some great spice to go with the bitters that you would use for that. So, I mean, I, I'm really impressed with what it is. But I'm not going to recommend it as, like, drinking it by itself. I don't know, Brad. Does that – would you agree with that? Uh, honestly, I just sipped it for the first time um, neat. And honestly, I think I would compare it to, like, a Summer Shandy from Line & Kugel. Like, I love Summer Shandy. It's delicious and tasty and the lemonade and beer. It just – when it's cold on a hot summer day, it's beautiful. But I don't want more than one of them. Like, it's too sugary – it's kind of like having uh, like an angry orchard. Like it's so sugary that like yeah, it tastes good. But if I have more than one of them, it just gets sickening. Um, the first sip of this, I was actually really impressed. I, I wasn't overpowered by the spices. Um, it's it's very low proof, so it's nice and sweet. It's easy to to stomach. Like the alcohol isn't going to slow you down in any way. Um, I, I really did pick up on some of those orange notes that I that I smelt on the front end. So it's something that I would drink like an ounce of neat, and then I'd be happy, and I'd be fine with that, and I wouldn't want any more. I mean, it really is like drinking a low-proof old-fashioned. It's it's very yeah. it's very sweet. Uh, Austin, like I will say, I really appreciate getting this bottle, uh, but the star of the show is that hundred-proof bourbon. Like if you're gonna, yeah. even if you're like gonna go to their distillery and buy something, like yeah, if you really want to buy the Memphis Toddy, go for it. It's 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 good on its own merits. But the 100 proof bourbon is the star of the show for sure. And I've heard that with similar products. I know Makers makes a, a mint julep, and then there's a couple other similar things like that. And they're, they're good for the, the ease of, you know, a cocktail to just pour it over ice, but they're not, you know, they're not their flagship product and they're not the flagship product for a reason. But that does sound good. But y'all talked about, uh, the the summer shandy and you can only drink one of those y'all been out of college too long <laughs> <laughs> we're very well, we're very just, lame <laughs> I, yeah, I was gonna say for me it's just the sugar like i like i can eat i can drink pbr with the best of them like i can down it it's for me it's man i get two or three of those summer shandies in me and the sugar content's just so high i start to get a headache like right away and maybe that's maybe that's just me being an old man, but Bob and Bob I and I are know. both going to be thirty this year, so thirty going on I, sixty. <laughs> <laughs> so I get uh in the uh, in my bourbon side, I get called uh, the coroner because I will kill any bottle you have, no matter how sw <laughs> how much swill it is. And I get made fun of because I really like White Claw. I like I like obviously I like bourbon whiskey, and I also like craft beer a lot. But you can't hardly beat a good White Claw, dude. I, I have I have a theory though that I think whiskey drinkers like White Claw more than the general population. Because like, I've drank so much whiskey neat that I can't do like a cocktail with sugary stuff in it anymore. Like if I'm gonna do a cocktail, it's gonna be like a Manhattan, like at at the sugariest. You know what I mean? And White Claw is like, there's no sugar in that. It's it's just like no. sparkling water, a little bit of flavor, and alcohol. Like. I do not feel shame, my friend. I, I can down White Claw with you in solidarity. Yeah, I agree with you. Honestly, I'm turning into an old man too because I can I can drink all the whiskey in the world and, not, and feel fine the next day, maybe a little headache or something. But as soon as we have a cocktail night or something like that, even just drinking old fashions, I you know one or two is fine. But after that, I wake up with the worst headache ever. Yeah, dude, that sugar. I guess I'm content, getting old too. It, it'll get you. <laughs> what, dude? Come join the dark side. <laughs> All right, guys. So I want y'all to talk about your podcast. What, you did already a little bit, but you know, talk about what y'all do, what y'all have coming up, anything y'all want to plug. Go for it. Well, honestly, uh, we just are finishing up our season two. Uh, we've been doing this for a year and a half now. Um, we separate our seasons into 32 episodes. And then we take those 32 movies that we reviewed and we put them in a head-to-head -head March Madness style bracket. And honestly, Bob, Bob, Bob can affirm this for me. 
it is probably the most fun we have with the podcast. I mean, doing these brackets is just an absolute blast. So in the next few weeks, uh, I, I think it's next Monday and then next Thursday, we're going to have our season two uh, bracket episodes coming up. So check that out. It's it's really a lot of fun. Yeah, it's 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 a ton of fun because Brad and I each, like we, we make this bracket, we seed all the movies, and then we fill out our own brackets. And as we go through each matchup, we're like, okay, what needs to move on? And if we're in agreement, that movie moves to the next round. But if we're not, if we're at like a you know a, a deadlock, we have to flip a coin to decide what moves on. And uh, we've had some pretty heated debates. I think last year we knocked Brad's favorite movie of all time, Star Wars, out of the Sweet Sixteen, and he still hasn't forgiven me for that. Yeah, and then this year we knocked one of Brad's favorite movies of all time. Oh wait, is that is that a preview? I was gonna say, just... don't don't spoil it, Brad. But oh, I can geez. feel your bitterness through the microphone right now. Y'all, I was so mad. I was screaming through my, my headphones when y'all knocked out Star Wars <laughs> in the season one finale. I have oh, a lot of I, I have a lot mad. of allies in the force when it comes to that one. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you know, the basic concept of our show is Bob and Brad are regular guys. I, I'm a movie nerd. I'm introducing Brad to some of these movies. Some of them he's seen, some of them he hasn't. And the kind of refreshing thing is like I try to bring a lot of trivia, a lot of history into things and give some context. And Brad is kind of able to show up like not not having been steeped in all that history and just give his honest opinion and say, like, yeah, I think The Wizard of Oz is a trash movie. And here's why. And kind of tear down some of these, you know, golden calves that we have of movies in America. And it's it's been really fun to do it that way. And then in each episode, we take a break. We try a new bottle or a new type of whiskey. And it's been really fun for both of us to kind of develop more of a whiskey reviewing language together as we've walked through this. Honestly, we've seen the most interaction from the whiskey community. Like, I have to give a huge shout out to, like, all the people that follow us on Instagram. It's almost entirely whiskey drinkers. And that's really, really cool because now we've got, like, a community of people who are like, hey, I came to hear your review of Weller Antique or whatever, but... Here's my thoughts on this movie. You guys made me go back and watch this movie again. And I think that's what's been the most fun is the interactive element of it. So, yeah, I mean, next week on Monday and Thursday, we're going to be premiering our season two bracket challenge Uh, on our website. We're actually uploading a bracket that you can download yourself and fill out if you'd like to. We're going to do some head to head matchups in our Instagram stories to get some fan votes. So it's really, really fun. It's a perfect time to join if you've never listened because you can follow along with the bracket challenge. And then the following week, we jump right into season three. Um, the first movie we're doing in season three is Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. So we're starting out on a high note there. That's awesome. I, I think I found you guys right right at the beginning because I, I had either just started or was about to start my podcast. And I just searched, I went on Google Podcast and searched whiskey. And well, it helps that y'all had whiskey in the name. But uh, I was like, ooh, film and whiskey. Okay, that's interesting. And I was I was uh, working an internship and I was not doing much, so I I binged like the three or four episodes y'all had out already, and fell in love right away. It uh, and it was it was cool to see because y'all at the time were about you know a little bit bigger than me, but not about the same size. And I mean y'all have grown a lot since then, but it was cool. It was like okay, so I I can I can jump in this do this as well. Uh, I couldn't review movies like y'all, but I could you know do some whiskey. Um, but I mean, this, it's, I love the podcast. It's been fun. It's, it's really helped me more, more pay more attention into what both what I'm drinking and what I'm watching. I've learned a lot about different movies that I thought I loved and no longer love. I, I learned that there's, there's some whiskeys that y'all like that. I absolutely hate. And there's a <laughs> whiskey in particular that y'all really hate that I really love. But the same thing with movies, It there's movies that I've, I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head, but that I didn't really, I didn't really like going into. And then I rewatch after listening to your podcast and things y'all pointed out. I'm like, okay, so that's why I don't like the movie. I just, you know, just little nitpicks like that. It's, I've learned a lot from just listening and a lot of movies, a lot of times if I've never seen the movie, I'll listen to your episode beforehand. I know it's spoilers and all that, but and then I'll know what to what to look for when I watch the movie. And there's only been a few that I haven't followed up and actually watched. And it's usually the movies that y'all uh, <laughs> Trash. tear down. Yeah. 
Honestly, man, but that's, I have to... that's like that's the biggest compliment someone can give us, though. Like, it, we kind of feel like if we can get one person to go watch a movie that they wouldn't have watched beforehand, or try one whiskey, or like you said with Back to the Future, go back and reevaluate something yeah. that they thought was different than what it actually is, then I think you know we've done our jobs, and that's been that's been really refreshing for both of us. Whether we're watching a movie for the first time or the fiftieth time, that you know things change, and the fun part is in like recognizing how you've changed as you, you know, watch each and every one of them. Yeah. And honestly, like when, when we review these movies, we like, we don't want to be a downer. Like we don't come into a movie to go and, Oh yeah, let's just trash this movie. I'm just, I can't wait to tear it down. And like the same thing with whiskeys, like we don't come into a whiskey review going, Oh man, I can't wait for four roses to get it. We're just going to rip them apart. Like, like, like that's not us. Like, we want to drink good whiskey. We want to watch good films. And if you think a movie's great and we don't, like, that's awesome. Like, that's like that's the hallmark of democracy. Like, you're allowed to have different opinions about things. You just got to talk about it. Just, like, let us know why you love it. Let us know why you hate it. Uh, and that's, you know, we have a lot of fun with that. There's, it feels like in general, Bob and I usually have consensus on movies, um, but not always, you know, every once in a while you have an internal sunshine of the spotless mind that just utterly divides the podcast to the point where we're not sure if we're going to record the next episode, <laughs> but you know, we push through and we make it on and it's just, it's just so much fun to go through these movies with your best friend. Man, it's all, I w- so I would recommend their podcast to you, but they don't like mellow corn. So I can't, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Though. Y'all, y'all need to check this out. Uh, it's a film and whiskey podcast, and correct me if I'm wrong, but y'all are on all the major podcast platforms. Uh, really, to find uh, where can they find you on social media? So you can actually find us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Film Whiskey. Uh, the one that we update the most is Instagram. That seems to be the one that like we get the most listener feedback. So I would check us out at Film Whiskey on Instagram. Yeah, I would, I would agree that their Instagram is really cool. They post. Uh, updates on every episode each week and then they post their scores and so if you don't listen to podcasts for whatever reason you can still you know keep uh stay updated and everything but uh and i i just wanted to second that before we go i wanted to second that the whiskey community is a great community especially on instagram and i've learned that if people are whiskey nerds they're usually nerds and something else and so it's real easy to get them in on like say movies or something like that uh, it's, it's, it's a great community that, I mean, that's how I found, I found y'all's Instagram right before I found your podcast. And that's, I mean, that's how we became friends, uh, podcast friends. I'm just, again, just glad you didn't have me on for that mellow corn episode because <laughs> I would have left friendship over. <laughs> well, anyway, awesome. guys, we're just, we're just so thankful to be on the show with you. Um, you know, really, uh, you know, while we're while we're recording this, there's a lot of stuff going on in the country, and and all I have to say is that like personal relationships with other people are such a blessing. Um, and Austin, getting to know you better has been such a blessing. And I just think that there's a lot of love out there for people um, of all of everything, and we we really need to lean into that love and communication and. And care for one another. So Austin, it, dude, it's such a pleasure to be on your podcast, man. Yeah, thank you guys. I really love having y'all. Y'all have been great supporters of my show. Um, they even y'all uh, listeners check out their blog. They have a really awesome guest blogger that appears uh, every now and then. Uh, he he write his writing's kind of bad, but it's got good topics. Um, but no, I really appreciate y'all coming on. Uh, really appreciate y'all keeping this podcast going, entertaining. And at least entertaining me during this this time of quarantine and this time of you know kind of unrest. It's it's a good uh, a good uh, thing to look forward to each week. Well, thanks so much, man. We really appreciate it. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. I'll catch y'all next time. Cheers. Thanks for listening, guys. If you enjoyed the podcast, make sure you subscribe on whichever player you're using. Leave a comment and leave a five star review if you can. Once you've done that, go follow me on Instagram at Bourboneering or on Twitter at nbourbon or go like our Facebook page, uh, Bourboneering. All this, as well as my Prestige Decanter affiliate link and a link to sign up for a weekly newsletter are all below. Thanks for listening, everybody. Cheers.